All right. And it is almost 10.30 somewhere or 3.30 somewhere else or 12.30 here. Um, so with that, another warm welcome to Adam Anderson, who is going to present to us about a SQL Server environment setup using automation tools like Docker and PowerShell. Um, extra kudos again um, to Adam for getting up um, literally in the middle of the night. Um, Adam will have natural pauses in between where we're going to take questions. So if you have any questions, just put them into the Q&A and um, I will ask them to Adam whenever we get to those breaks. And with that, um, Adam, please, the stage is all yours. Thank you. Uh, yes, I wanted to say uh, thank you. Welcome uh, to everybody who's joined us and for, for this session on environment automation. My name is Adam Anderson, and I've been in IT for about 25 years and database development for uh, about 15 years. Lately, I have really been working very hard on the PowerShell and uh, environment automations at my most recent um, uh, company. So this is a topic that is very uh, near and dear to my heart. A uh, couple of the things here uh, to contact me, please go to LinkedIn, uh, the, the, the address at the top there. Also, I am available on Twitter at SQL Pioneer. And all of the slides, presentation, and a lot of other information is at my GitHub page on the bottom. You can down, if you want this PowerPoint, you can just go there and there is a presentation folder. In, in fact, um, right here, uh, there is an overview and you go into presentations and this hub, there's an automation presentation and that's where the PowerPoint is right there, as well as all the scripts that I'm using for this presentation are right here. I actually have them open in my uh, VS Code window. So you can see I'll be using all of this right during this presentation. So feel free to go to GitHub and download and enjoy. And I would like to put out a very heartfelt thank you to all of the sponsors for the program. We could not be here without them. And uh, please, you know, please check them out if you if you haven't, or say thank you if you already uh, if you do know them. Okay, so today we're gonna to talk about Docker. What is Docker? And I'm gonna give a brief overview of what it is and how it works. Then we're gonna go into uh, why would you use it? Because uh, you may or may not know, Docker is meant to create a container, use it, and then get rid of it. And that doesn't really work that well with databases. So there's, there's ways around that, obviously, or we wouldn't be here talking about it. But um, when I first was hearing about putting SQL Server in a Docker container, it kind of confused me on why I would want to do that. So I'm, I'm covering a use case here that I think is pretty compelling, and I hope you like it too. PowerShell automation, I'm ending with that, not because it's uh, probably because it's the most important. The things that I'm talking about here is, uh, yeah, I'm focusing in on Docker, but you could do this same thing with um, uh, virtual machines. You can do this with a lot of different technologies on, on a lot of different clouds. I just happen to be choosing Docker as the, as the, um, the environment engine that I'm choosing. And we'll just go into to that, but you can use it on any particular platform. So what is Docker? Now, one thing that I do want to uh, mention here is a lot of times you hear Kubernetes and Docker in the same sentence. And what are these things? Kubernetes is a different brand name. They do bring different features and functionality. But um, Docker, you know, and Docker is, again, just another brand name who, who helped uh, pioneer this, this technologies. So the technology is really containers. 
And those other two are just the brand names that we commonly refer to them. So I will be saying Docker a lot in here. That is just out of habit. In, in reality, it just means a container. And a lot of, while the commands are different on Kubernetes, the theory is the same with containers and, and such. So containers versus VMs. I use this analogy to help understand what is a container. A container is effectively a uh, application that runs on top of the host operating system. So on the left-hand side here, you see the VM and you see the infrastructure, the hypervisor, then you have the OS. While in a container world, you have the infrastructure, the host OS, and then the container manager. Notice the hypervisor isn't, isn't there. Now that's not to say you can't use Docker on a VM. And in fact, you can in a lot of cases, it's actually would work pretty well, but those cases would be test. Those cases would be, uh, you know, QA. I would not, you can do it for production, but you're kind of missing the point of containerization if you're using it on top of a VM because that VM would then be taking a little bit of that, that fraction of inner uh, of memory and inner uh, uh, resources. So putting that on bare metal is what uh, Docker, or you know, what the container services recommend. So what do we do with Docker? What, what is it, how does it work? So on the right-hand side, you can see there's a container registry and what I mean by that is that's on the internet. That's Docker Hub, that's Microsoft Azure Container Registry and, and any other sources uh, that provide locations to download images. Now, one thing that I hadn't really brought up before this is right in the middle there, you see images and containers. Those are two different things. Images are, I equate them in my head to a, a, a zip file that knows how to run, that knows how to start up. So it's, it's a grouping of files that are grouped together into an image. And then when you type Docker run on the left-hand side, you can see if you type Docker run, it goes into that Docker daemon and it will then create a container from that image. And when it's doing that, it goes into the metadata around that container and that has an entry point that starts that container. So what that means is it knows how to execute that, I mean, effectively. So when we do a Docker pull here on the, on the left-hand side, the word Docker is just referring to the Docker host, the Docker daemon. Pull is referring to going over here, grabbing the, the image out of the registry, pulling it down to your local registry on the computer that's running Docker. Then when you do Docker run, it creates the container from that image. And then I threw Docker start in here. And that's because you can start and stop containers without destroying them. And that's just an example of you, any Docker commands that you're putting in, go through this daemon and then, and then do their work. So how do we get started? Well, Microsoft has a set of container uh, images out there that you can pull from. You can just do Docker pull Microsoft container registry up to this colon. And that will assume the latest tag. In this particular case, in these two examples, I'm showing you how to download the latest 2019 and the latest 2017 versions of SQL Server if you want to specify the version that you're looking for. But in reality, this is how you download that SQL image. It's, it's pretty easy, actually. The thing that kind of messed me up a little bit, and this is a word of warning and caution a little, is Microsoft uh, discontinued their Windows SQL Server container in July. 
my presentation the last several times I've given it was based off that Windows presentation, <laughs> that Windows container. So um, I had a little bit of a rude awakening when I opened up all my, my presentations uh, a month or two ago and was like, oh, nothing works anymore. So that is something to keep in mind that these technologies are changing and they do change. So you got to stay on top of these. It's not a problem because they put out the information ahead of time. You just have to watch those sources on what's happening and what's going on. So SQL Server is a Linux only container uh, going forward, unless you want to create your own container, which is or your own image and container, which is way outside the scope of this presentation. So now we've downloaded the Docker image. Now what? Well, Docker run. Uh, this is pretty much the only command needed for getting a SQL server up and running. That's it. Docker run. And then as you can see on the bottom, this probably looks familiar, the container name down here, or I'm sorry, I, I use container. The image name at the bottom, the port that we're porting to, and 1433 is the SQL Server port that it runs on, and then the SA password and, uh, and the uh, accept the license agreement. Now, uh, I will be going into what the dash P and the E and, and those things mean in a minute, but this, these are the commands. If you copied and pasted this, and the little tick here at the end, um, that is just the next line um, for PowerShell. So don't let that confuse you. This is technically a single line of code in PowerShell. Um, and it could, it's the same exact thing in DOS or, or whatever um, uh, shell command you're using. So I'm using that a lot just for readability in these slides. But uh, in reality, these are just one line. Now I said that's all you needed, but in fact, you probably want a few other things just because it makes it easier to work with and easier to use on a, on a regular basis. So I'm still doing the dash P, so I'm still porting the, or I'm still making the SQL Server port available outside of that container. But I'm this time giving the container a name. And in this case, I shortened AdventureWorks uh, to AW Preprod. And then I'm giving a host name. And this is very much in Docker terms like a DNS entry uh, where Preprod should, should route that is, is my understanding. I'm not, uh, I'm not an expert at Docker. But that's my understanding of what that command does. And now one thing that did bite me recently as well, changing from Windows to Linux, SA password must be capitalized. And the main reason, and same with except license, uh, EULA. The main reason I mentioned that is Windows is not cap sensitive where Linux is. And in a lot of presentations, a lot of articles out on the internet, SA password is written in small letters. And it took me forever to figure out that no, that actually matters. You must capitalize that when you're, when you're doing this. So just a word of warning there, um, don't get bitten by that. And then this one here is a new command. This one's a volume. And this is creating a volume called AW preprod backup and then mapping the location inside the container. So if I'm SQL Server, when I go to restore my backups, this is the path that I will put in to the SQL Server um, restore command. And then in this one, I added RM as a parameter and I'll, uh, like I said, the parameters and what they all are is uh, actually the next slide, but um, RM is remove container. So when I hit stop, when I stop this container, 
the container will automatically be, del be deleted. But anything in this volume... <music> So that's where the real trick is with Docker, is any data that you want to keep, you put in a volume. You don't put it inside the container because the container is ephemeral. It goes away. As soon as you, like with this command, as soon as I hit Docker stop AW preprod, it will, it'll just delete itself. So that's not good for a database. So now I'm going to put that inside this volume and then that data can live on. If I imagine this was not a backup volume, maybe this is the data volume. Well, when I do that, now if I start a new version of a, a container, it, it can automatically connect to that data volume and just pick right up where the other container left off. So in one example, that's a very, very good use case for Docker is you could be running one version of SQL Server, type Docker stop, kills that container, Docker run, brings up a new container and all the security patches are now installed. Like if you've downloaded that latest image and all the security patches are on there, you in one minute, have just upgraded your SQL server. And if you're doing it behind a IP router, um, the name's escaping me at the moment, but you could just redirect traffic to the new container name and such. It's, it's all very, very fast. And that's one of the things that Kubernetes really brings to the table is that container orchestration. If you stop one, it'll automatically restart and, and you can really work with that and add a lot of value in that very quickly. So parameters, optional parameters, I call them here. Um, name, name of container, host name. Now, one of the things to notice here, the double hyphens are the verbose name of the command where dash H is the alias, the short, the short name of the same command. So either one of these two are equivalent and um, go ahead and use either one, does not matter. So dash H network alias, uh, volume path, or you know V for volume, E for environment variable. So I was using E a lot and that is because Microsoft requires you to accept their license agreement and uh, set a SA password. The container will not start if you don't do that. Dash D, you'll see used a lot in the presentation here, that is detached, meaning if I don't put that, whatever window I started this container in, you'll see the exact logs going past for the starting up of SQL Server, which is actually very interesting to look at and very helpful for uh, troubleshooting purposes. So you can see exactly what's going on with that container. But then, you know, you want to just escape out of that and then let the container keep running. So other Docker commands to get started. Docker pull, we did already cover. That's downloading the image from the Docker repository. Run is creating that container image, creating a container from an image. Docker start and Docker stop are, if you don't include the RM command, then you can start and stop a container at will. And the main advantage of that is say you're a your development group and you have five, 10 people, you might not all be developing at the same time. So you could just stop your SQL Server container, give back that memory and CPU resources that you're not using at this point, and, and allow others to work with that. If you're a QA department um, where you're doing testing, you could do the same thing. Anytime you need a container image, you can, you can either do a Docker run and create one from scratch, 
or you could just stop and start the containers. And in that way, you're really optimizing the resources that you have at your fingertips because while they say hard drives, uh, disk space is cheap, it's not cheap for SQL servers. And um, it's cheaper than it used to be, but it's definitely not cheap. And that's the same thing with memory and CPUs is resources do, do matter, they do count. And um, this is one way to really optimize what you're doing. Docker commands to manage containers. So specifically containers here, PS show all the containers running. PS-A is all containers stopped and started. RM, now this RM here is literally typing the words Docker RM. And in my previous example, it would be RM AW underscore preprod. Right, so that would delete that pre-prod container. But as opposed to dash dash rm in the run command. So those very similar syntax, but um, they, they are done at different times. Docker executable or Docker exec is executing a command in a running container. Now, one thing that I didn't mention uh, prior to this is when containers run, they are completely independent and, and you cannot reach into a container or reach outside the container unless you specifically tell it, I want this port open. I'm gonna give it this port mapping from in my previous example, 1433 goes to 1433. Now, if I wanna run more than one SQL server, as I will go to in, in my example, you can start the SQL server will be on 1433 inside the container, but you could map that to 1401 on the outside of the container. Then when you go to access your SQL server, you would access it on port 1401. So in that way, you can kind of create that hole that goes in to the container. That is to say with this execute command, this is necessary because you can't be just sitting on your command prompt and go into that container um, just by doing some, you know, some directory change or something like that. It doesn't work that way. You have to do a Docker exec and then the name of the container you wanna execute against. I have the example in a minute, but that's how you get inside that container. Then you can start doing your LS, you know, your list command or your make directories or, or whatever you want to do. But you have to do it through that command. And then finally, on this one that's, that's uh, quite important is the copy command, Docker CP. And that's how you get files to and from a container. Next is images. And uh, the, there's only a couple commands here for this one, Docker images is how you work with the images that you've downloaded to your local repository. RMI removes the image. If you remember, RM removes a container. This one removes the image. And then one that I found very useful, and it, it's kind of a cool thing, is you can take a container that's been running. You could stop that container and do a Docker commit, and you can create an image from that container. This would mostly be used as, if, as an example, if you're having a production, if you're having a container in production or a container somewhere that's acting up, but you don't wanna troubleshoot it on that machine, you can commit that container um, to an image and then start that image up somewhere else in order to do that troubleshoot. So in that way, uh, it, it can be very helpful, but I'm using it in here as it was, it's, in a, way, it's a way of create my image. It's, it's kind of a beginner level. I can create the container I want, copy the stuff in there I want, attach the databases I want, and then I can commit that container to an image. Now I can restart it and I'm right back where I left off. 
So if you're used to Git uh, using the Git uh, uh, version control, it would be the same thing as committing your code to version control in a different, in a branch. So then you could just change branches, start working again. And then if you need to, you can go back to your original commit and uh, pick up where you left off. So um, are there any questions at this time? Um, otherwise we can uh, ask the questions a little bit later as well. Uh, none so far, so you're good okay. to go. Excellent. So uh, Docker image support. So one of the use cases that I found very compelling, and I'm gonna explain this really quick. Um, this use case that, that I, I love is you have your production data, but obviously you don't want that data in development. That can be really bad and illegal in some, uh, you know, in some scenarios. So one way you can get around that potentially anyway, depends on your regulations. I'm not gonna tell you what your, your laws are, but is removing that confidential data through de-identification, through various tools, or you can write the stuff yourself. But in this use case, you can take a full production data set and just, you know, you have your backup up. You have your production data set, you make a backup. I think of that as a pre-production image that might be used for um, user acceptance testing. I've been at a number of companies where the users want to actually see their real life use cases that you've now solved their problem. So, and they're obviously authorized to see production because they're, they're the ones telling you, hey, in production, we have this problem. So in this particular example, a pre-production image would be that exact data, that ex everything fully, fully there so they can see what that is. But that's also gonna be a very secure environment. So you're, you're gonna be treating it just exactly like prop. In a test image, I'm considering that potentially a full data set, but with the confidential data removed. Now there's a number of ways you can do that manually. You can rewrite, overwrite numbers using uh, random number generators. Uh, one way that I particularly am fond of is I create a file that I would use for first names, last names, social security numbers, whatever. And then I would use that random number thing to update a table with a random name with a random social security number or something to that effect. And the reason I do it that way is it's much faster to do an insert when you have a big list of things and you're not inserting it and updating row by row. If you had a full data set that you've imported, it's much faster to do the import or the update statement from one data set to another data set as opposed to row by row if you have a lot of data. But honestly, when it comes to creating that test image and removing confidential data, I wouldn't, I wouldn't program it manually. I would, I would buy a tool. If you have the wherewithal within your company and you have the need to de-identify and, and make this data confidential, I would just, I'd pay the money. I would really, I really would. They're not that expensive. And um, there's a lot of very good, great tools, including one of our sponsors here, I know for sure. Uh, Redgate has a very good uh, plat uh, very good tool for doing that work. So I wouldn't even try rolling my own on this one particularly. I would uh, purchase that tool. The dev image, uh, moving to the next level. For me, I'm going to delete 90% of my data. And I was at a conference a few years ago when we could go in person. And uh, Steve Jones uh, was was there. And I was like, hey, how do I do this? And he's like, oh, just remove the confidential data and, and reduce the data set by 90%. I went, oh, that's cool. All right. And I walked away. And then I was like, how do I do that? Like, that's easier said than done. But uh, so one of the ways that I thought about it, because I was thinking about the problem, how do I go about doing that? 
And one of the main ways that I thought about it is uh, most databases that I've dealt with, and, and yours might be an exception, but most databases only have a few tables that are the big guys, the big primary tables for the database. Like you might have a hundred tables, you might have a thousand tables. But I would, I would place a pretty good wager that you don't have maybe t more than 10% of your tables are really super critical. As in uh, an example, you have a retail organization where you're selling things. In that organization, you're probably going to have a customer table, an order table, and a product table. All right. And there's going to be some others out there, obviously, but that's going to be your big three. So if I pick, I'm going to keep, I, I have some really good examples of difficult use cases. And I'm going to pick these hundred order numbers, these hundred customers, and this hundred, maybe it's not even a hundred products. Maybe it's, you know, what, however many products you want to, you want to keep. And I'm going to delete everything. Well, for, first of all, if I have the orders, I'm then going to go to the customers and I'm going to say, give me all the orders that go with these customers. And I'm going to go to the orders and say, give me all the customers that are part of these orders. So now I've created an inclusive table that defines all the orders, all the customers, and all the products that I want to keep. Now I can just do delete from table we're not in this other table. It's very fast, very quick. You can keep the use cases that you want specifically, but be, and because you've de-identified that data, it's all confidential. It's not, and in most cases, I would suspect that would be fine uh, to do that type of work. It, now, don't get me wrong. If you can generate random data, and just replace, just create an entire fake data set with random data, I would do that. That would be my first choice. But I don't think, but I, 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 have a, I haven't been in a scenario where I can do that. I work in data warehouses and randomly generating data for five, 10 different data sources, and then having that data all gel together when you join it into your final data set, if I have 10 different ones, I might have the same product coming from my warehouse management system, from my uh, enterprise resource, my ERP system, and maybe my front end website. Well, generating data to meet the criteria to join all that back together in my warehouse can be quite challenging. So using that technique of I'm going to keep this customer and I'm going to keep these orders and these products or whatever the situation is, then I can keep a cohesive data set that when I run an ETL and join it all together, I have that data. And the reason I mention that is now with that assumptions that I have my pre-prod image, my test image, my development image, that's what I'm using as my use case. Now I'm, I'm showing you here a... Um, kind of an eye chart when it comes to uh, uh, Docker and how I would set this up in this use case. But starting on the uh, left-hand side, volumes. So first of all, I have my bind mount and I didn't go into the difference between a bind mount and a regular volume. A bind mount is effectively a, like a window share. You can think of it that way. You can connect it to an outside resource, like a UNC path on a, on a Windows file share or something to that effect, or the local drive location or whatever. But a Docker volume is managed by Docker. You don't tell it where to go other than in your configuration of Docker. Um, Docker manages that volume for you. You can create multiple volumes. That volume lives on past the end of the container. This is exactly where all that data saves, right? In, in either your bind mount, I, would, I use that for backups, 
um, and your Docker volume, you can also use that for backups or you can use, and also you can use that for the database locations. And in fact, that's where you're meant to put your databases. But one little known thing that, or little thought of idea, I think in a Docker is when you create an image, that is the starting point for your container the next time you run it. And what I mean by that is, if you notice right here in the middle, well, here, let me move on to the next one. In my Docker environment, SQL Server image is based off of a base image, like Linux. Then they add SQL Server onto that image. Then we're creating a development image that I mentioned on the previous slide based on that SQL Server image. So you can see we're creating images on top of images. And there's a, there's a benefit to that because then you don't, if the underlying their containers have layers and depending on how you create them, you don't need to re-download the entire image every single time. If you've created it correctly, you only need to download certain parts of the image. So that's where this becomes beneficial in, in the order you do it and how you create those, those images. But in this example for dev image, um, okay. So in this example for dev image, I'm putting the database inside the container, inside the image itself, not in a volume or anything like that. Because as a developer, I'm oftentimes wanting to run something. I run an ETL and then I want to reset my, uh, my, I want to reset my environment and run the ETL again. So I can rerun a process. Say it's a 15 minute process. I can take and create my container, produce my code, put my, my test changes, onto that container, run my, my session and see what happens. If I don't like it, I simply delete the container and restart it. And I'm right back to this development image of what it was before I made my change. So it's kind of a way of fast iteration. This schema for the database that's in this image might be, um, might be the same as production. In fact, I would recommend that it is the same as production as much as you can. So say you're doing a two week deployment cycle, you might create a new dev image, QA image um, every two weeks. And you can do that through fully automated scripts. So it's not, it's not like a, a really difficult task. You just simply run a PowerShell script and your image is updated or run a build if you're doing it using a Docker build but I won't be getting into Docker build because I don't have time for that, <laughs> not in this uh, presentation. So as you can see here, putting the database inside the image, put the Q, uh, and I'm also putting the database inside the QA image. Now you do have to be careful when you're getting into that QA image, because if you remember, that was a full-size data set. You don't want your containers to be too large, right? How large is too large? I can't answer that. That's up to your hardware. That's just remember these things have to download to whatever repository, whatever computer you're working on. So um, that's kind of where your limit is on, on what you're doing there. So, you know, I wouldn't hesitate for, for a few gigs to maybe even, maybe even larger. But uh, when you're getting into that QA size, you might want to put that database in the Docker volume. Maybe not. Uh, that's a that's up to your use case. And so then these are my images. I can create my container based on that image. Now you notice here I'm calling out that I'm putting port 1435 for Dev one, 1436 for Dev two. These are both running on the same Docker host, but just mapping to different ports. So each user is connecting into a different port in order to get their instance of SQL Server. And then I personally would keep production on 1433, the default image. Um, but so you can, you can kind of see how I'm looking at that. 
and what's going on. So how would I use this? Docker workflow for me, as a developer, I'm gonna create my image, I'm gonna deploy my version, uh, my, my database code, and Eaton had a great presentation uh, just prior to me where he was talking about SSDT and deploying the code using that technology. That would be a perfect segue. That's what this is right here, build server, artifact repository. That could be your SSDT. That could be your Redgate uh, build tools. That could be Flyway DB. There's a lot of different technologies out there for version control and uh, building artifacts. And so pick one of those, watch various presentations on that and learn how to do that. So you create your container, you deploy your code to it. You might write your code, saving that in version control. You'll create that build and you might actually have your test image run during your build process. So somebody commits code, your build server can actually generate this or create this container, run a whole host of unit tests that you've created. And if all the unit tests pass, then it goes ahead and generates the artifact, right? So the, the point, the part where it's already here at this end, you might be almost done with your testing. You, this, you, there's a lot of different testing and it's too big of a topic to go into uh, in the session, but just know this can be extremely powerful because now if you have, if you're like a, a lot of data warehouses, their ETL processes take a long, long time. Uh, it's not uncommon for them to be multi-hour, you know, two, three, four hours to run. A, uh, an exchange transform load uh, ETL. And so that can really hamper things. If I'm writing code, I want to test that code. Well, maybe it takes four hours before I know the result of this code change that I just implemented. That might be true, but if you have 10 developers, now you're only doing it once a day and it can get really muddy on, in the water on what, what's happening there. So you can create a build server, have it run an ETL, four hours later, it's running the testing on that ETL, saving that test results, and then uh, it's done. But you can have that running for five different developers at one time. So you can really multi-thread what you're doing and uh, increase productivity significantly. So uh, Ben, is how are we doing for questions? Oh, we are still good. Yeah, okay, good. I'm glad I'm doing such an amazing job. All right. You sure? <laughs> okay, so PowerShell for the win. Now, how do you do all this? I've talked a lot about the use case. I've talked about using Docker, what is Docker and, and hopefully kind of explain what it is and why we might want to use it for this circumstance. But how do you actually do that? I would recommend using PowerShell, obviously. And for me, it's just, it's really easy to automate. You have wonderful tools out there like DBA Tools, which is a community led project that um, last I saw, I think it was at around 600 functions that DBA tools has available for, for working in SQL Server. It's truly amazing. You can do almost anything in it. Um, PowerShell is great for security. You cannot do anything in PowerShell if you don't have the security rights to do it in Windows. So in other words, you can't bypass security. If you have security in Windows to do something, you'll have security in PowerShell to do it. But they're the same thing. The security uh, is, is implemented the exact same way. You can't do more in one than the other. But you can do everything in PowerShell that you can do in the UI as long as the tool, as long as the software is designed to work that way. And then you can also do, uh, it can really help for fast development life cycles 
really quick return on investment. As an example, uh, at a company I work at, we have a single button, like we press one button, run one command, and it restores over a hundred databases to, I want to say six or seven different servers all at the same time, because after their two week sprint is over, they want to press this button and now they've redone everything based off of what the work they just completed. So extremely powerful. One button, press the button, walk away, a hundred databases across multiple servers all being restored, and you're going and getting coffee. Like that's extremely powerful stuff. So the other reason that I like it is look at the difference of the two commands, the command on the top and the command on the bottom. Declare file name. So the, in this example, you would be restoring a, or you'd be backing up a database to a file name that includes the date. So like year, month, day, would this format is what this format would be. But if you're going to do that in T-SQL, you, you can't just pass in variables and whatever. You can't do string concatenation in this command because you syntax error. So you have to create it ahead of time and declare variables. And I, I don't like doing this. That's my preference is backup DBA database, tell it the, the server name you're connecting to. This will back up every database on that machine and add the date timestamp to, to that name. However, it's not that limited. Here's the DBA uh, data, here's the DBA backup uh, I can't talk. The backup DBA database command in all of its help. So as you can see, this is a very much a word jumble. This is one set of commands that can be used together. This is a different set of commands that can be used together. You, not every command is in this one and in this one. Some of these command line switches exclude other things to be used in conjunction with them. And the same with this third grouping. But the point is, these are all variables, right? PowerShell is very, very good at passing variables and, and making everything dynamic. Whenever I'm writing a PowerShell script, I usually write it very specific the first time. And then I simply add variables in to make it generic so now I have one script that'll work on 15, 20 different servers. So that's extremely powerful. These backup commands, this, uh, this is backup and restore. And you can see some examples of how that would work. What exactly I would do. These are the common commands that I use all the time. Um, I also have credentials that I have encrypted and saved in a command so that way nobody gets to see them still it's very secure and I don't need to expose any of my stuff I can create those credentials in fact I do from an Azure key vault so I'm not storing that information anywhere other than in a secure location I can read that in create my credential use it and then destroy it Right, so this is a, a, a way you can really be secure in your programming. So, and you can see the restore and the backup commands are very, very similar and um, pretty easy to use. And I'm running a little bit behind, so I'm going to uh, go through a little quicker. One question that I always had, and, and I hope this would be very helpful, you can type get command 
dash module DBA tools, and it'll print it all out to the command line that you're typing it in. However, if you add this pipe out grid view, it'll print all the commands to the uh, grid view. And then you can just simply click in the filter button and just start typing backup. And it'll filter the entire result set and just show you the commands with the word backup in them. Right, so in this way, you can use the help that is built into PowerShell in order to find this information. Get command is your friend when it comes to figuring out what's possible in PowerShell. I see a couple things going on in chat. Is there anything, any questions there? There is um, one question on uh, how up, if you have updates in dev, how are they transferred to the UAT environment? Um, that would be using the build, uh, the build and deploy tool suites. So outside of, um, excuse me, uh, I'm, I'm trying to think through the question. So I believe what they're, what they're asking is, would you deploy the changes to the container and then save that as an image and then bring that through to QA or something to that effect. And I would not recommend doing it that way. I would have your container image be, like I said, an emulation of production. Because one of the things that we're trying to do here in this situation is increase our automation for deploying code changes. So this is a lot of what's in this presentation is making an assumption that maybe I shouldn't be making, but it's also assuming that you're gonna deploy your code using an automated fashion, whether that's a DAC pack or something else. So you would deploy to, you'd create this container in test, then you would take and deploy your DAC pack onto that test container, then you can run your tests against that. And in that way, you're emulating what you're gonna do when you go to production. Because now in production, you're, you're effectively creating a way to test your DAC pack deployment, is what I'm saying. Makes sense. Okay. Uh, so PowerShell basics, I, I, I don't wanna get too basic here, but just uh, you know some, some real quick things so you can kind of see the examples. Uh, variable, dollar sign, and then a word is your variable. I put in, uh, this would be the, the values in that variable. Set alias. Now this, I love this command. I actually have this in my PowerShell profile. So when I start PowerShell, this command is run. So I use Notepad++ as a editor a lot. I also use VS Code a lot as well, but to me, Notepad is just very quick, very easy uh, to edit things. So I create a alias called edit, and then I just simply type edit and then the name of the file I wanna edit, and it opens it up. Really slick, really, really cool. Edit profile is an example. And what I can show is I have my PowerShell command. I can do edit um, profile, and it opens up my, my notepad profile. And so you can see this, this profile is effectively what runs every time you start a PowerShell window. So I'm creating various drive paths. In that um, GitHub repo, these, this presentation path, this alias PS drive path is used a lot. And that's because I didn't want to assume a particular directory is being used on your computers when you download it. So I created a drive path called PRES for presentation, and then I mapped it to where I want. If you create that PS drive path, you can set whatever path you want. And a lot of that scripting in the, uh, in the GitHub repo should just work. 
Um, so in that way, it can be very, very nice. I also do this type of thing a lot for like my GitHub repo, um, data, you know, what, wherever. Any place that I'm going to on a regular basis, I can simply um, type in uh, change directory, P-R-E-S colon, and now I'm in the, my presentation directory. So that's how you can use that type of command. Um, and that's, that's this one here. So then set location and CD are the same thing. CD is the alias. You can also use ls, or not ls, that would be dir, that would be directory, but change directory, right? So same, same type thing. A few years ago, when I was uh, first learning PowerShell, I, I was hearing this, this one gentleman talking, and I hear a lot about hash table, hash table this, I'm going to create a hash table for this. I had no clue what they were talking about. And so that bothered me. I don't like not knowing things. So I went out and, and figured it out to learn it. And effectively, what it is, is something they call a key value pair. So the first part is I'm given a variable, and then I'm setting that variable with my equals. So this part here is the hash table down to this. So you can see here's the key, and here's the value. So this effectively creates a key value pair between these two commands. So now I can type on the command line config.server instance, and it will return localhost comma 1401. Invoke SQL command. So invoke SQL, if for those of you who don't know, is the PowerShell command for executing a SQL command. Um, this is in the Microsoft. Um, if you have SQL Server Management Studio installed on your computer, I believe it's there by default. Otherwise, um, yeah, you can install the SQL Server. SQL Server is the name of the module that also has that command in it. I believe DBA Tools has changed theirs to invoke query, if I remember correctly. But anyway, um, so the reason you do this config all of these variables here, all these keys, as they're called, if I do this at sign, this is called splatting. So I can splat config, and what it will do is invoke SQL will say, all right, this is a parameter in invoke SQL. I'm going to take the key and assume that that's what you want for your SQL command. I'm going to take the database. That's another command. That's another parameter available in SQL command. Same with all of these. They're all parameters in the invoke SQL function. And by splatting this, it takes and effectively passes all these variables into that command just with this one simple variable. So you could, if you're working with say five different servers, you could create five different hash tables for for the um, for the different servers, and that way you don't need to type all this information and save yourself that work. I can also combine the word query and not put query inside the hash, and put at config dash query and then type my query into that SQL command, and that will work as well. So you can combine splatting and variable configuration. So that way is it's just kind of cleaner, a little bit easier to read, a little bit easier to to work with, and uh, and so you don't need to type quite as much. So kind of bringing this back a little bit to now that we're in PowerShell, what are we doing here? I'm using some code highlighting to try to highlight some of the Docker commands specifically. So Docker run p. Here's my environment variable. So you can see this would all be one command in PowerShell. Uh, these are all the various other commands that I would be working with in PowerShell. This is also the SQL Server commands that, that I can use once I have that container created. So what I'm trying to get at here is this might be 
the invoke SQL or the restore. Once I have a SQL server instance running in a container, I can just use restore database, DBA database as my command to restore my databases. But notice the path here is that same path for inside the container. The container cannot reach out of that container to get a file unless you've created a volume uh, of some type in order to get that information. If it's a bind mount, then yeah, you can reach out and, and do that. But that's bind mounts are not necessarily recommended by the container community because of, I, my understanding is because of performance problems, but um, it's they consider it better practice to copy that um, copy that file inside the container or inside the either in the container or in the uh, volume, and then do your restore command from there. So on the screen, what you're seeing is I'm running my container. I, I'm creating the container from the image that, that uh, Microsoft provides. Then I'm running my execute command and I'm making a directory for my backup. I am running a copy command to copy the database inside the container. And then I'm running my database restore to restore that database in that container. So this would be a complete how you set up one of your containers. And then you can do that Docker commit command and turn that container into an image. And now you have your development image and you're ready to go. Now, one thing I mentioned earlier, or, uh, and I want to reiterate, that commit command is not the same as a Docker build command. And I'm not going into Docker build because it's, it's a whole nother realm. It's a whole nother presentation. But build is a way of the proper way of creating a image. You run build and it's installing these things inside of, uh, of that image and it's building it up as it goes. And if I'm doing an actual build, that would be a later evolution in my skills on getting started with containers. Just getting started, just getting your feet wet, getting this containers out there, creating databases inside of it, using this type of command is extremely valuable when it comes to, uh, and, and pretty easy, right? This, this is not uh, um, terribly difficult after you've been kind of shown how to do that. And then finally, managing a Docker volume. These are some of the techniques that I've had to learn recently because uh, they changed and got rid of my Windows container. So when I went to Linux, I am running Windows uh, 10 on my laptop, but I'm running a Linux container. And I cannot do a bind mount from Linux to Windows. So I had to actually figure out, how do I copy this data? into my container? How do I, you know, what do I do? And one of the things that I read is a lot of times they're recommending creating a helper container. So I don't necessarily need to go through my SQL container to do my backup. In this case, I'm downloading a Microsoft PowerShell container because I'm also doing a PowerShell presentation and I'm naming it helper. Now, if you know anything about this container, it will automatically stop as soon as if I don't include IT. IT means interactive, so it connects to it and keeps it open. But if I remove this command, it would just it would create the container and then it would just instantly stop and not be running. But that's OK, because now I can do a Docker copy command and I could uh, I could copy that file into that container right here in you know into a specific location and even into a stopped container i can do that now the one thing that i want you to notice there's a difference between the first copy command and the second one this is copying a file outside the container inside the container then this one's copying from inside the container to outside the container. 
this is the outside the container part. So whatever directory you're in, a dot means go to that directory. So I, I could have put here uh, dot slash backup as, a, as another example. But dot is kind of the, the term in PowerShell for relative command to where I'm at currently. So in other words, this confused the living heck out of me when I first started. There are more verbose commands. If you type docker help cp, you will get a lot more information about this command. And there's actually parameters you could put in. But if you're not using those parameters, the stuff on the left of the space is, is um, where you're copying from. The command on the right side of that space is where you're copying to. So you can see there helper colon backup is on the way in on the first one, is the second command. So it's the destination on that command and it's the source on the second command. So I found that really kind of blew my mind actually when I first was, was figuring this out and learning this. So I thought I'd call that out uh, separately. And then if I want, I can do a Docker start dash I for interactive and then the container helper. So now I have a container running PowerShell. It's Linux. It's a Linux container running PowerShell. And it's, um, I can also access my SQL Server container from it. Now my host name didn't work for me, but it's because I didn't use a Docker Compose to create the multiple containers at one time. And again, that's kind of outside the, the scope of this presentation, but just know that if you're using a Docker Compose to create multiple containers and start them at the same time, then my understanding is by default, they share networking. So you can then access one from the other. And then of course, I'm using the Docker RM to remove that helper container when I'm done with it. So, you know, I just wanted to call out like this, this stuff's not too bad. I tried to keep this fairly simple and give you that idea. A lot of the concepts that, that I'm talking about in this presentation are you can get started using these commands, but just know you're kind of dipping your toes into pretty deep water. And so you can get started, you can get working. If you find that this works for you, then you can start digging in and learning Docker build. You can start learning, um, you know, networking and volumes and, and all these things, you can start getting that information a, a lot deeper. But just know that containerization tools are a very, very deep subject. And uh, there's a lot to learn there, but there's a lot of richness. So creating these environments as code, now I can stop that developer from saying, well, it worked on my machine. Well put it in a container and then let me see it, right? That, that's the whole purpose of this. But in the SQL Server world, we're using a boxed up program, right? SQL Server's already created for us. So I hope this use case that, that I presented here where you can put the databases inside that container, now you can reset as a developer, you can reset that container back to what it was and run your scenario again. Now you've recreated a repeatable process that can reset back to the beginning. Try it again, reset back, try it again. It can be used for testing, development. It can be used for production, no problem, right? Microsoft does provide support for SQL Server running in Linux in production. So in that way, it's also very good for upgrades, right? That was the original use case that I saw when I saw Bob Ward presenting at a past SQL summit. And a lot of the big thing that he was talking about was just that. You can upgrade really easy. And in my head, I'm like, yeah, but I do that once every five years. So I didn't find it that compelling. But to me, this is a really compelling use case.
I didn't think about security patches at that time because we do security patches every month. So in that way, you can, you can save quite a bit uh, of time there with uh, containers. But I, I particularly like this use case test. So, so Ben, how are we doing? We are good. There is one question from uh, Salam, um, who is a bit confused with the um, help concept. Um, so maybe you can elaborate a bit more on that. So the question is, you start the helper, um, then SQL should be running, then you, you use the second copy command to transfer a backup file, and then you stop the helper again. Is that correct? Yes. Yeah. And, and helper is just the name of a container. It's just a random name. It could be random generator, random letters. Um, but obviously, I thought it was <laughs> nice to call it helper. Helpful to name it helper. <laughs> <laughs> exactly. Um, but really, it's a container that can be used to access other containers, or specifically volumes. Like when I was when I was looking at this, it was a little bit confusing of how I was supposed to copy the data in and out of a container. And um, a lot of uh, several of the articles I read were all about well, create a helper container. To, come, to use that, because if I actually, here, let me switch over, because I, I do have some of these. Let me run, I gotta get my, oops, sorry. F8, did I run the command? Yep, there we go. And so now if I create, I'm gonna go down here to this container. And when I go ahead and run this, you will see on the side over here, here's my images that I have. Now I can do all this through PowerShell, but I think it makes a pretty good use case for VS Code as well. I downloaded the Docker um, add-in and you can see my container running in here. And you can see, uh, I thought I created a volume here. Interesting, it did not create the volume. But, oh, there it is. I'm like, I, I swear it should, should have created that volume. Uh, so now, yes, I can go to um, my command here. So this is in a different script. This creates that same PowerShell helper container and I can access that same volume from this other container. So if I'm running this one as well, it, uh, yeah, I should be okay. In my head, I'm like, do I need to load my credentials again? Uh, <laughs> and, oh, that's odd. Oh, for some reason it added a whole bunch of commands to my, to my uh, spot in the bottom. But uh, actually one thing to notice here is it created this container. Now after running this helper container, notice my command prompt is no longer C get, it's just PS. So now if I do a dir, this is inside that helper container. Here's my backup directory that I that I created, but it's it was created in this other in this other location, and I mapped it. Um, in this container, I mapped it to just backup. So you can see that path is right up here. If I do dir backup, there's nothing in it. But if I copy right here to that helper. Um, to that command, it should run. Apparently my computer is being a little slow at the moment, I'm sorry. I swear I'm hitting the right keys. Okay. We'll do it that way. <laughs> oh. 
Okay, now I'm really confused. <laughs> Nothing like live demos, but um, that's very odd. Let me try going over here. So now it copied that file inside that container. Oh, I know why, because I'm still in my container. You can't do the Docker command inside of a Docker container. But I did my other window um, to copy that file in and it should have been there. So nothing like live demos, right? But if effectively that's, that's how you would do that. This should have copied that in there. Uh, oh, system can't find the specified path. I'm not in the right, I'm not in the right backup location. So I don't want to take too much time uh, figuring that part out at the moment. But you, you get the idea. I wasn't in the right directory in that other window to copy this file, but effectively it would have copied this file into this helper container to the backup directory. And then I should have saw it in that directory. So then, oops, undo. Down here, I just do exit to exit that container. So now I'm outside of that container. And uh, oh, now it tried executing my two commands. <laughs> so fun. I guess I got to uh, update my script there to uh, include the uh, backup data directory. But notice I, as soon as I exited here, this container immediately stopped. So that's also pretty important on how that works. Any other questions? No, um, not for now. So thank you so much. Great. Again, dear attendees, if there's any remaining questions, feel free to drop them into chat or the Q&A. Mm -hmm. But um, and for some from what I can tell, I'm you've covered it all. Yeah, for some reason, I'm not seeing my slide for um, my contact information. So I will go back to the beginning of my slide deck. And uh, if anybody wants to contact me, there you go. Any one of these Excellent. sources, I'm happy to talk and uh, answer any questions. Okay. We got one more follow-up from Salam. Um, so how does that, is that backup file transferred from the helper to the SQL code? Um, it would be through that Docker daemon and uh, from the from the volume to the so the copy command is effectively just copying that file through the Docker executable, right? It's it's reaching into that container and copying it to wherever you're telling it to. If that's to your local drive, it's going to copy it local. If that was a network drive, it would copy it to there. Awesome. Good stuff. Yeah. And, and uh, don't get me wrong, I'm feeling a, a little nervous here because, uh, you know, Ben literally did a, a big session the other day or uh, last year on, um, on Kubernetes. So I feel like I'm presenting to the expert and he should be answering all these questions. <laughs> oh, I should not. Um, uh, you did an awesome job. Um... Uh, be believe it or not, um, I never questioned what dash IT actually means. So today I learned that it stands for interactive. I mean, thinking about it, it makes perfect sense. But um, I was like, okay, that's how you do it. Someone thought something about that. Um, let's not question and just use it. So um, no matter how long you're using a product or a technology, there's always something new to learn. So thank you so much for that. Excellent. Awesome. Well, I hope everybody enjoyed it. And, Thank uh, you so much again for getting up at that um, ungodly hour. Oh, no problem. And then it again, it's an almost honor. sunrise time for you. So. Um. Uh, yeah, a few more hours. <laughs> 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 maybe I'll uh, maybe I'll go uh, go relax for a little bit before starting work. <laughs> I, I can tell you that that is what I would do. So thank you again so much, Adam, for presenting to us. And um, this actually concludes my moderator duties on, on track one.